The Student Young Pugwash Project on Ethical Science was lucky enough to sit down with Professor Martin Rees, the UK's Astronomer Royal, to hear his thoughts on ethical science and the opportunities and challenges in ethics for scientists today. Lord Rees is based at Cambridge University, where he is a Fellow and former Master of Trinity College. He is a member of the House of Lords and a former President of the Royal Society. His research interests include space exploration, black holes, galaxy formation, the multiverse, and prospects for extraterrestrial life. He is co-founder of the Centre for the Study of Existential Risks at Cambridge University. In addition to academic publications, he has written many general articles and 10 books, most recently, On the Future, Prospects for Humanity. Our first question to Martin was, why should scientists engage with the public? I think a larger proportion of the issues which democratic governments have to decide have a scientific component to them. If we think of everything to do with energy, climate, health or the environment, then it's not just science, but science is important. And that's why all voters, if they're to take part in the debates and get above the level of just slogans, they need to have a feel for science and also be a uh, numerate enough not to be bamboozled by bad statistics etc so it's important that everyone should have a general feel for science they can't be specialists of course but they've got to un understand it and of course uh, our education system has to ensure that happens as well as ensuring that some fraction of people can end up as specialists so uh, science is so much embedded in our lives now that everyone has to surely have a feel for it, otherwise they're left out of important public debates. Well, that's a, it's very interesting to ask how scientists can have the uh, best influence. Of course, I know a lot of people who have been uh, scientific advisors in government departments, and they tend to get frustrated. That's because politicians obviously have immediate concerns, and um, as we've seen in COVID-19, the scientists do get traction when there's an immediate problem, but when it's not immediate, as in the case of, say, climate change, when it's concerning the long term and is global, then it's very hard to move that up the agenda compared to issues which politicians focus on, which are the local ones, um, parochial ones, and short term before the next election. So it's very hard for scientists to have a direct influence. And that's why. I think it's important that they should, wherever possible, engage with the wider public, the journalists, blogs and all the rest. And if possible, influence really charismatic figures who can get through to the public, because politicians will respond to issues like climate change and biodiversity if they think the public cares. And that's why I think it's so important that we should uh, cherish global charismatic figures. And let me give you four very disparate quartets. Um, Pope Francis, David Attenborough, Bill Gates, and Greta Thunberg. You couldn't think of four people more different than those four, but they've all had a real global influence and made the public aware They've stimulated demonstrations of young people who naturally care most about the long term. And politicians now know that these are issues that the public cares about and therefore are more likely to uh, uh, feel they can take decisions which are good in the long term without feeling they will lose votes. Let me give one specific example in this country, a small version of what happened. Um, Michael Gove, when he was the uh, uh, Minister for the Environment about three or four years ago, he introduced legislation to ban non-reusable drinking straws and things like that, uh, because that will reduce uh, long-term pollution in the oceans, etc. And this wasn't an issue which the public cared about at all, until millions of them watched the BBC programme Blue Planet 2, fronted by David Attenborough, which discussed this issue and showed in particular an iconic picture of uh, an albatross returning to its nest and coughing up for its young, not the long for nourishment, the bits of plastic. And that impressed people, just like the iconic picture for climate change is the polar bear and the melting ice flow. And so because of programs like that, millions of people were aware 
that plastics in the ocean were an issue. And Mr. Gove felt that he would not lose votes if he used a bit of his uh, 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 political capital on this particular issue and campaign. So I think the public has to be aware of these issues and you've got to make them care about the long term. And here again, of course, especially problematic in the case of climate change, because as we know, uh, it's uh, threatening already, but the worst outcome, if we continue business as usual, will be in the second half of the century, when we will reach tipping points and maybe irreversible changes. And if you're an uh, economist deciding whether to put up an office building or something like that, you discount future benefits and you don't give much weight to what happens after, say, 2050, more than 30 years ahead. And therefore, you won't prioritize actions which will have a big benefit or avoid a big harm in the second half of the century. And that's why you've got to think differently from in standard economics. You've got to uh, not discriminate on grounds of date of birth. You've got to think that the uh, life chances of a baby born today are the same as those of older people and therefore care about what things will be like at the end of a century when today's children will hopefully still be alive. So you've got to persuade politicians to think long term and they will do that if they know that voters think long term because they care about their children and grandchildren. There are going to be some ethical concerns if we really try to ensure that we can feed the world in 2050 when there will be 9 billion people in the world and many of them now are not adequately fed. So we need to increase food production and we need to do this in a way that doesn't encroach too much on natural forests, etc. And this is going to involve um, intensive agriculture um, uh, and GM crops and things like that, which uh, some people uh, think are unethical. Unreasonably, I think, because in the United States, 300 million people have for the last decade eaten GM crops with no detriment. So we've got to uh, ensure that uh, everyone is happy to use these modern techniques. And incidentally, I think we will have to um, uh, have less beef eating and perhaps uh, um, get our protein partly from exotic things like uh, insects and maggots and partly also um, to make artificial meat which is possible. So I think there are going to be issues about how far we go in using modern technology uh, in order to, uh, to meet our needs. Just as of course in medicine um, we know that we can use um, gene editing techniques to um, uh, remove uh, harmful genes that cause diseases like Huntington's disease. But there are going to be issues like, uh, should we use genetic techniques to uh, modify or enhance people, things like that. So uh, the advances in biotech are going to raise a new uh, set of, uh, of uh, ethical issues. And of course, uh, they're going to raise a new set of dangers because the misuse of uh, biotech could of course be catastrophic if it leads to the uh, creation of even more lethal viruses than the natural ones, for instance. So there are more and more issues which are going to uh, be at the forefront if we are trying to cope with the population in 2050 and beyond. Thank you so much to Professor Lord Martin Rees for this interview. For more information about the project in ethical science, please visit our website at britishpugwash.org.